It all seemed to be going according to plan as we descended into the orbit of the planets. Yet, in an instant, the weapon platforms came online. These automated turrets easily carved our ships in two as though they were made of paper. We were trapped in a swarm of automated killing machines. Greetings loyal members and welcome to this Dominion War special episode on fortifications. This particular episode was requested by Commander Chase Rector and I know it's been a while but finally got round to it and we'll be seeing many more special episodes like this. This one particularly, this is a kind of a warm-up to the Battle of Chintoka, which is obviously one of the main instances where we will see large-scale fortifications in use. So I decided we should go through it here in this special episode format to discuss what with all is involved in not just planetary fortifications, but system-wide fortifications. We've talked before about star bases, and this is kind of connected with them. So if you haven't watched that episode on star bases and how star bases function, go back and watch that because this will tie into, inevitably, levels of fortification. So when we're talking about system fortifications, we're not just talking about the weapon systems, the things that actually shoot at enemy starships. We are talking about it as a whole interconnected system of systems. It's a defensive network, ultimately. That's what we're viewing it as, is, it, is that it is a defensive network. Now, many of us have become very well acquainted with the famous defensive onion diagram, which is how to survive on a modern battlefield. There are some caveats to that which don't apply to system defense. Unlike the defensive onion, which... The first and foremost thing is to not be there, not be acquired, you know the rest. However, this can't really be applied to a system since you are a static, known position and you have to take other approaches in order to balance out this inequity. You know, the first, the first layer of the defensive onion, don't be there. You can't move, you're a system, you're there. Don't be acquired, you're already known. Everyone knows where a star system is unless you happen to not be on anyone's star charts, which can be done. Space is vast, after all, and you could particularly hide... If you want to hide certain strategic assets, like a, a fuel supply or an ammo dump, in perhaps just like a little rogue planet, just out in the middle of nowhere, yeah, that's a decent way of not being acquired. But again, that's only going to work for so long at a, and at a relatively small scale. So you will be acquired, you will be engaged, while the wider fleet can work to keep the enemy away from you, there's really nothing you can do yourself to prevent yourself being engaged. Again, if you're a system, if you're a defensive platform, you will be hit because you can't move. However, the key thing to mention is that being penetrated by, a, by an attack, or being affected by an attack, those are optional, and there's things that you can do about that to either minimalize or prevent that entirely. So, the defensive onion for static positions looks a little bit different. The first principle is to know where you are. You might say, well, that's a bit obvious, but it's worth bearing in mind that, of course, during a war, the front lines and lines of battle will shift. And when that's happening, Bearing in mind the position of a certain system or fortification is quite important, not just for its potential use as a, perhaps a, a hinge of manoeuvre, but also as a potential bastion of defence, also potentially as an obstacle, you put, your, you put that system between you and your enemy, you use it as basically a road bump, it's another option. So, knowing where you are is, you know, more being aware of what's going on around you as much as it is anything else. The next step, and this is kind of tied into that, is to know what's coming. Specifically, know what the enemy is doing. That's obviously very difficult. And again, these are things that potentially a planetary defense system in and of itself isn't going to have access to. But there should be a good level of communication that if there is somebody coming your way, or potentially the enemy is brewing something for you, you should be at least made aware of it by the people who are going out there and doing the reconnaissance. 
Now we get to more active levels where it is now the Defence Network's responsibility, and that is to track enemy movements, engage threats, concentrate your outgoing fire, or ensure the effectiveness of your outgoing fire, disperse or minimalize the effectiveness of incoming fire, limit the penetration of your perimeter, and ensure redundancy, and so as to minimize any damage done in an attack. So, those are the primary principles of system defense, or system fortification. So how do you implement this? Well, you need a whole range of different systems. You need to have layered defenses. You need to have active defenses, as well as having potentially your own starships. You also want to have shields, weapons, fighters, drones, defense platforms. And then you have your passive defenses. These can be things like sensors, or as I've mentioned before with star bases, burying your critical assets in asteroids or other kind of uh, defenses. So we'll talk primarily about the more kind of active elements, so your weapons and your shields. And this is a very broad category because, of course, weapons can take many, many forms. The primary form is, of course, turrets. I did mention fighters, but turrets are going to be your main means of defense. Well, there's two I'm going to go into because these are where most of the fighting is happening. That's Federation and Cardassian. So the Federation turrets are very, very old. They're from the late 23rd century and they've been upgraded. Some have been upgraded, some have not been upgraded. But the Federation approach was to build turrets in battle clusters. So you would have a torpedo turret flanked by potentially three phaser turrets which provide it with sort of close-in protection. And each of these turrets relies on its own independent power source. Now, there are, of course, problems with that. You have less ammunition, less capacitors for phasers or whatever. Uh, you've got to make sure that there's fuel and batteries and things like that. The Federation turrets are generally not manned, but they were originally built that, so that they could be manned. Uh, but they're, of course, all automated at this point. But so, yeah, a key thing to bear in mind is they separate phasers and torpedoes into separate platforms, although they are deployed together in mutually supporting positions. And they have independent power sources, which, of course, means that they run on their own power. That does also up their maintenance, although, of course, they're not always running their reactors. Most of the time, they're just going off of battery power. They only activate their reactors if they need to charge up their batteries or if action has commenced and they need to switch on their shields and begin firing their weapons. Now we have Cardassian weapon platforms, which are a very, very different animal. They're much newer to begin with. They are a much newer system and have been enhanced by the Dominion. They make use of large siege caliber weapons. They're not firing regular Cardassian torpedoes. They're firing plasma torpedoes and spiral wave lances. That's why they cut through enemy ships so easily. So these are, you can see on a scale chart, these are large platforms. These are the size of small starships. So these are not small platforms. These are very large. Per unit, they are more costly than a individual Federation turret. They are probably, however, cheaper than an entire battle cluster, which is realistically what it's doing. It's doing the job of an entire battle cluster in one turret. Now you can see that there is a sort of a problem. Remember I mentioned that principle of uh, redundancy. Now in a Federation battle cluster, even if you take out the torpedo turret, you still have to then steer clear of the phasers and realistically you're not going to get close to the torpedo turret without first having to deal with the phasers. Okay, so you take out the phasers. Well, okay, even if you take out one phaser, there's still two other phaser turrets and the torpedo turret still engaging you. You know, whereas with these Cardassian turrets, if you take out one, you take out both the threats of the plasma torpedoes and the lances. Now, of course, the result is that you just deploy more turrets because they're, they're cheaper than a battle cluster, 
but a battle cluster is able to cover a much wider area than a single Cardassian turret is as well. So, you already see swings and roundabouts. The Cardassian turrets also rely on a shared power source. This is uh, provided from a gener remote generator. The energy is transmitted via subspace carrier waves. Now, there are plenty of ways to deal with this. Not only can you target the generator, you can also block the subspace carrier waves to individual turrets, although that, that takes a lot of finessing and a lot of time to work out, but it, it's a thing that can be done. Uh, the main problem with the subspace carrier wave is that it's relatively short range. So you actually have to have your turrets relatively close to the power source. You can't have a power source at the you know, core of the system and have it powering turrets throughout the entire system. That It doesn't work like that. You, it doesn't have the range to do that. So you're narrowing your defensive perimeter and you're giving up you're kind of giving up a little bit of that ability to have layered defenses. Because, of course, um, you know, in order to have layered defenses, you'd have to have multiple sets of these. And, of course, it gets harder and harder with a system. Of course, the distances get bigger and bigger the further out you go into, into a planetary system. And so it becomes much more difficult to supply and sustain all those turrets with independent power sources, whilst also making sure that they're well protected enough. So there's there's problems there, but, you know, it's a combination of compromises. Now, with other races, your mileage will vary. I'm sure some races have turrets that are more similar to the Federation approach. Others will have more, simil more turrets that are more similar to the Cardassian approach. It really depends on the species and the era. There's a, there's a lot of variety, particularly with Klingon fortifications, because Klingons have fortifications going way back, and there, a lot of them are still in use. And it's impossible to know with Romulan fortifications, because they spend most of their time cloaked. You know, so those are the offensive elements of the active defences. But there's other ways to protect a system, and not just with big shields. If we go down to the most basic level, the most basic defence you can put down is a transport inhibitor. Stops you getting beamed up onto a, into the brig of a starship, stops the enemy beaming down and shooting at you. Now, you can take that one step further with dampening fields. Now, with dampening fields, there's a whole array of different things you can do with them. Again, you can use them to block transporters. Critically, you can also use them to block sensors. And why those are key is because a lot of the time, for orbital bombardment, which is, of course, a very looming and pressing threat, orbital bombardment is only really effective if you know what you're shooting at. If you don't really know where your target is, you can't really effectively engage it with an, with an orbital bombardment. And so... By using a dampening field, you can either deter the enemy from using orbital bombardments or indeed greatly minimise the impact that that will have. You can also use it to disable vehicles. If you don't want the enemy to have vehicles, they don't get vehicles. Equally, that means you don't get vehicles, but if you don't have any, I guess that's not a problem. If you don't want to shoot and you just want to solve things mano a mano with uh, with bladed weapons you can create a dampening field that makes uh, particle weapons completely ineffective and force your enemy into a melee it's a perfectly valid tactic if you want to do it and certainly that, that does have some good applications so dampening fields are a very uh, flexible form of defense that won't keep the enemy out and they won't keep the enemy from attacking you, but there are many and varied ways that they can inconvenience the enemy. Make their life a little bit harder. Then you have localized shields, or dome shields, as we'd call them. These literally are just energy shields that project over a, a city or a base or whatever. Uh, sometimes they're not even a full dome. Often enough, they're just an umbrella. So they're projected up into the atmosphere, and again, to prevent from being shot at, from space, but they are open to the rest of the planet, uh, which means you can just slip troops underneath the shield. But again, that means that you have to get off your starship and come down to the planet and again, take them on and again, have to contend with potentially dampening fields and these other things. The most ironclad defense is, of course, the planetary shield. 
If you're lucky enough to have one, basically the only planets that are going to have planetary shields are home worlds. And they are very, very difficult to get through. You can't beam people through them. You can't send shuttles through them. The only thing you can do is shoot at them. Now, planetary shields have a lot of energy. But because the planet can't move, they do have to accept that they're being shot at. The only thing that a planet can really do to prevent the draining of a planetary shield is to to have its own offensive weapons. So, torpedo turrets, phaser turrets, you know, various forms of, again, various forms of offensive weaponry that are going to deter a starship from getting into firing range. That's easier said than done because the starship has the privilege of uh, initiative. A starship can always decide when and when not to move into range to shoot at you. And so you can't really go after it. So it's going to know ahead of time when it's attacking, you're always going to be having to react to what the starships are doing. This is why having starships of your own is extraordinarily helpful in this circumstances, because it means that you can actually hold some level of initiative, or at least have some level of warning before starships pop into orbit and start lobbing torpedoes at you. Okay, so we've talked a lot about things that go bang, all the things that stop things from going bang. But the third and most important part of any kind of weapon system are the sensors. It's how the weapons actually hit their targets. And with a star system, you have the ability to deploy a wide variety of very extensive and very powerful sensor grids. For starters, you can put a warp field detection grid at the system's perimeter. This will not only detect ships at warp within the system, it will also alert you for it will alert you at a good distance of warp fields in the area because warp fields are, you know, pretty unusual things. They're pretty easy to detect. So with a warp field detection grid, you can see an enemy fleet coming hours away. Hours away. So it's very useful for that. You also have your just more typical sensor arrays and tracking arrays. You also, of course, have your subspace communication arrays. Um, you can use that potentially to jam the enemy fleet if you want. You've got a very powerful subspace antenna somewhere in that system or several. You can use that to jam enemy communications if you want. Uh, again, you're the defender. You're just sitting there. You don't really need to talk potentially. You just have to shoot. The other thing you can have is a detection grid. So this is more of a tripwire designed to detect ships at sublight or indeed potentially cloaked ships, depending on how advanced your detection grid is. But you can use it to keep out cloaked ships, although those are very, very expensive and very modern. Again, that's probably something that's going to be limited to high, high value systems. Everyone else just has to guess. Now, this is all very good and jolly. But it's no good if you can't correlate all this information and then get it out to the people that can action that information into defensive measures. So what you need then is an information interlink system. The reason you need an information interlink system is because isolated systems, they don't communicate with each other, so they're slow to respond to developments. They also can be very easily tricked. A lot of Federation turrets that weren't upgraded, particularly in the early part of the war, they weren't very effective because basically what would happen is that there would be a one-two punch attack. So the Jem'Hadar fighters would come in, fire on the turrets, not really be very effective, but they draw the fire of the turrets, and then the battle cruisers would come in and fire off their torpedoes and just blow the things away. Because they were automated, they would fall for this every single time because the programming stated that the priority target was the last thing that shot at you which almost always meant that they were just chasing the last threat not the incoming threat they're also not very aggressive in persecuting targets again say one battle cluster has engaged a enemy cruiser and that it, and it's inflicted a lot of damage on it and it's retreated and it's moving past this other defense cluster, but that defense cluster is busy engaging 
another ship that it was dealing with. Well, there's an opportunity there to take out that target. But because that defense cluster isn't in communication with the other defense cluster, it's not going to realize that that is the priority target. So it's not going to engage it until it's finished engaging this other ship, by which time that damaged ship has gotten away and is going to be able to repair and come back to fight another day. So isolated systems are not great at persecuting targets. There's some value to isolated defenses in terms of it's just easier to implement. It requires a lower level of investment, but it means that your defenses are operating in a level of diminished awareness. You're the defender. You should have almost a, a god's eye view of the battle space. And by having a isolated system, you know, there were there were tech there were hard technological limitations back in the 23rd century that meant that systems had to be isolated. But with communication systems being as advanced as they are in the 24th century, there's really no excuse to not have these interlinked communicating systems that can, like I say, be more aggressive in persecuting targets and a little bit wiser to trickery. So, that brings us on to 24th century systems and why they're so lethal. And the answer is interlink. Modern fortifications operate like an immune system. They are designed to contain and eradicate threats. And they can do this by not only just persecuting targets and perhaps specific targets, uh, they can prioritize certain targets that are perhaps a of a greater threat to the defensive system than others. Uh, so it's less easy to just distract them. It's just going to realize, you know, that, oh, these are all just transport ships. These are the ships that can actually threaten us. And so they'll prioritize those targets rather than the useless cargo ships which are just there to distract them so what we have is a form is a sophisticated form of kill chain so the kill chain begins with the intelligence is received the system is then alerted the target is then detected the target is then engaged a weapon is selected to engage it the weapon fires if the target is destroyed then we can repeat the cycle. If the target is not destroyed, you will fire again, or if the target has moved out of range of that particular system, you will re-engage it with another weapon system. That's the basic kill chain that we're looking at with this kind of system. So in summary, interlinked systems allow for the prioritization of threats and the allocation of appropriate resources to defeat them. So rather than allow the enemy to fight the target they want with the weapon they want you're going to shoot at them with the weapon they least like to be shot at with in the position they least like to be in now of course these are susceptible to jamming but if like i say communication is far more important to the attacker than the defender but it does diminish the effectiveness of these kind of systems if you jam communications you better have a good plan beforehand than going in. Ultimately, to defeat such systems outside of certain fluke scenarios, you require a detailed plan of attack, a high level of firepower, and a willingness to sustain losses. When you're going up against defensive fortifications, you will take losses. It is unavoidable. There is no way of outmaneuvering these systems. You've got to go into their territory and fight the enemy on their terms. And there's really very little you can do. In a properly fortified system, you are in the enemy's world. You are in their playground. You can try and break out. You can try and uh, make life difficult. But it's ultimately their home turf. And the systems have been designed to operate in that area. They're going to know it better than you. There's going to be nowhere to hide. But there is a final caveat that I will add to this, and this is that, of course, with a centralized system, as when you're interlinking systems, inevitably that does mean there will generally be some kind of centralization where the primary decisions are made. And that is a vulnerable target. That's a key vulnerability for these systems. So this 
is what modern warfare looks like in the 24th century. The operators of these systems will sit in cozy bunkers many miles deep underground or in an asteroid, while their enemies die in their hundreds to these automated swarms of killing machines. All I can say is, the computers deserve the medals. Thank you guys for watching, I hope you all enjoyed. Let me know what other kind of ideas you have for these specials, these kind of special episodes. What details of the war would you like filling in? You know, what hasn't been covered? All that sort of thing. And uh, leave your thoughts in the comments below. And I will see you all in the next video.